Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is the Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Hello and welcome to the Andrew Lawton Show, Canada's most irreverent talk show here on True North. It is Tuesday, February 7th, 2023, and I am back. Yes, I was unfortunately away last week. Uh, as I uh, believed uh, that I was uh, just a little bit sick. I didn't know what I had. Turned out I had pneumonia, which I have never had well conscious before, which is in and of itself a, a bit of a long story. Uh, but I have had uh, for the last three weeks uh, a bit of a cough and it, it wasn't going away. And I, I had the wherewithal to see my family doctor who said, well, actually, yes, you have pneumonia, which is uh, perhaps why you are still hacking away. So the downside of this is that I'm still a little bit sick or I have a little bit of a lingering cough and I'm hopefully going to get through the show without uh, blowing out your speakers slash eardrums by hacking into the microphone. But if I do, I want to apologize in advance and it is likely very fitting because the theme of the show is why everything is broken and I guess that includes my lungs for the time being. But I thank you very much to those of you who sent messages in saying, uh, where are you? I uh, didn't have the ability to announce my absence because I didn't know I was going to be absent until I no longer had a voice with which to make such an announcement but uh, i am back and it might be a little bit of a short show we'll see if i by the end of it have just uh, completely keeled over in the middle it was probably not meant to be but uh, thankfully i have a relief pitcher coming in uh, in about 15 minutes the great stella ambler former conservative member of parliament will be joining me to talk about the battlegrounds of municipal politics which oftentimes do not get nearly the attention they should but I think are tremendously influential in politics. And she is taking aim at wasteful, bloated city councils head on. So we will talk about that with Stella Ambler, who, again, I had to bump last week uh, because I was going to have her on. And it was hard to have her on when there was no show to have her on. So uh, thankfully, Stella was a good sport and was happy to join today. I want to talk about the brokenness of this country, though, because this has become, if you've been following Canadian politics, a political issue. When I actually didn't know that was the case and I, and I want to pull up here I wasn't going to but I have to promote myself a little bit I wrote a Substack column uh, in September of 2022 so this is now what October November December January February so uh, coming up on five months ago that I wrote nothing worked and that was basically my own version of everything is broken before it became trendy in conservative circles to say that everything was broken. And I didn't think I was making a political point. I wrote this column. I didn't talk about Justin Trudeau. I didn't talk about Pierre Polyev. I just talked about the fact that when you try to navigate the world, nothing is working. The airline can't deliver your bags. Customs can't clear you through. The passport office can't give you a passport. The restaurant doesn't have the server to bring you your food. Uh, there is isn't the thing you need at the grocery store. This was not a political observation on my part. This was just a cultural observation, looking around and seeing that, hey, it seems like everything in society right now is either completely broken or at the very least not functioning the way it is supposed to be. And this has become in the months since then, and I'm not saying that I influenced Pierre Polyev in any way, but in the months since then, this has become a key theme that Pierre Polyev has been bringing up when he speaks across the country, which is just the brokenness of the system in this country. And when I say the system, I'm talking about the broadest sense here. It isn't just about the public service and it isn't just about the passport offices, but I think there's a brokenness on a human level, which is contributing to a brokenness on all of the levels that are comprised of what humans are doing. And I think there's also in general, and this is the more esoteric point, an abdication by people of how broken things really are. And as such, an abdication of any really ability to fix these things. And this has become the key point of distinction between Justin Trudeau's approach and Pierre Polyev's approach. Pierre Polyev is saying, look, things aren't working. Things are broken. Canada is broken. Justin Trudeau has not just said that that's wrong in his view, but he has said that it is an offensive concept, that he draws the line in his words. He draws the line when Pierre Polyev gets up there and says that things are broken. Take a look. Mr. Polyev might choose to undermine our democracy by amplifying conspiracy theories. 
He might decide to run away from journalists when they ask him tough questions. That's how he brands himself. That's his choice. But when he says that Canada is broken, that's where we draw the line. This is Canada. And in Canada, better is always possible, but I don't accept Canadians and politicians that talk down our country. Let me be very clear. Let me be very clear for the record, Canada is not broken. Canada is not broken. That's the point that Justin Trudeau wants to hinge his legitimacy and his credibility on. That Canada is functioning just fine. Sure, we can always do better, but how dare you talk down to this country? And let me say that one of the biggest failings collectively of this country is I think the tendency to be satisfied with abject failure and the tendency to be satisfied with inferiority because oh we're better than someone else we accept failure of our healthcare system because oh well it's not the American system we accept failure of our foreign policy because, oh, well, you know, we have a different role to play. We're just, we're the peacekeeping nation, even though we send like three and a half peacekeepers a year now. Uh, so that's one of the biggest lies that Canadians tell themselves. We settle for inferiority because we have no sense of national pride that is rooted in any sort of meaningful, cohesive, unifying national identity that makes us want to strive for better. And this is something that I say not because I am unhappy with this country, not because I am not proud to be Canadian, but I say it because I think Canadians have, largely speaking, and I don't mean every individual Canadian, but I mean Canadian institutions, the media, academia, certainly the Canadian government, government right now, has allowed this inferiority mindset to take hold. Where we get so offended so offended at the idea that someone might say things aren't working that we don't actually look in the mirror and realize things aren't working. Take, for example, this whole nonsense that happened in my absence, which, uh, to be honest, might have actually contributed to my pneumonia and it spreading more because I was just like uh, so bothered by the infectious arguments being put forward by the NDP that apparently it had some bacterial effect. Who knows? I'm not blaming them for this entirely. But uh, when the NDP get up there and start trying to condemn Tucker Carlson from Fox News because they have the chronic inability to accept, detect, and take a joke. And Tucker Carlson, to his credit, responded to this very aptly by saying that, you know, Canadians get so excited when you notice them. They get so excited. They're like the stalker in the bedroom that, uh, you know, they're always focused on the U.S., but the U.S. doesn't know they exist most of the time. So he responded to it perfectly. But he makes this comment, you know, about, oh, maybe we should just invade Canada and liberate them from Justin Trudeau. Everyone jokes about it. They laugh about it. They move on. And this becomes like a political crisis in the House of Commons where the NDP, the Liberals are condemned condemning Tucker Carlson, when the conservatives don't, everyone jumps at them for supporting the armed invasion of Canada. Like, like this is not what a serious, legitimate country does in its hall of government. And the fact that you have Justin Trudeau saying Canada is not broken, and the NDP wasting time on condemning Tucker Carlson for making a joke about Canada, and any Canadian who has been unable to work for the last few years, Canadians who lost their job because of vaccine mandates, Canadians whose families were torn apart, Canadians that are dealing with or know someone who's dealing with an opioid addiction, all of these people are looking around saying, wow, you are really committed to this idea that everything is fine, that everything is all hunky-dory. And the problem, I think, is very internalized. There is a brokenness in a lot of people that is going to take years to repair, if it will be repaired at all. The pandemic was such a huge part of this because the government drove a wedge between families. They drove a wedge within families. I had someone message me today, and I, I haven't actually responded, and I probably won't respond because it's a very bad faith message. So consider this my response, and I don't know if the person's watching this show. They probably aren't, as you will uh, hear and detect in a moment. But someone, someone accused me and accused True North 
of driving wedges into families and dividing families and being divisive because we were critical of vaccine mandates. I, they aren't accusing the government that advanced vaccine mandates of being divisive. They're accusing us, me and my colleagues, for calling this out of being divisive. And this is probably someone who, the sense that I got from reading the message is that they have some family member who likes True North and who was telling them all sorts of stuff that they read on True North and they don't like it. So they're probably claiming that we're responsible for the divisions in their family. And I, I don't want to get involved in the business of someone else's family. It's not my place. And I, I've actually taken aim when governments and institutions have tried to do exactly that. But the reason I think this is such an important issue is because people in this country are divided. And government, rather than being unifying in the time of crisis, decided to champion more and more of those divisions, to repeatedly, fervently champion and advance more divisions. So you have family members in this country that aren't speaking to each other. And this is a direct product of what the championing of uh, various vaccine mandates, of divisive rhetoric, of polarization by the media, by the elites, by the political class, all of this over the last few years. And you have institutions that are never going to recover. You've got labor shortages, supply chain shortages. You've got people that don't support the fundamental idea of free speech because they uh, reframe it around this idea of harm. And I, I'm going a mile a minute here, and I, I'm not trying to make this an exhaustive, detail-oriented show. I'm talking about the fundamental, bigger-picture assertion here, that if you think things are not broken right now, you are absolutely delusional. And, and I think Justin Trudeau is either trying to gaslight Canadians into thinking that this brokenness that real people are experiencing does not exist, or he himself just has his head so far into the sand, he doesn't realize it. Because everything is fine in his world, everything's fine in his life, he doesn't have to confront the brokenness that everyone who voted for him, and everyone who didn't vote for him, but still got him as their prime minister, is living with right now. Now, I take issue with anyone claiming that a politician, including Pierre Polyev, is going to fix this. Because I believe that these are problems that, were exacerbated by the political class. But these are not exclusively political problems. These are problems that exist at a societal level. They're problems that exist at an individual level. And you'll hear all the time people talking about this idea of a pandemic amnesty, of do we forgive those that did all this stuff. And I, I am totally in favor of people moving on if they're able to. But I don't expect people that were denied the right to see family members, denied the right to get on planes, denied the right to leave the country. I don't take issue with those people perhaps saying, you know what, I'm not able just to move on from this. I'm not able to forgive and forget, to live and let live, to let bygones be bygones, because you all realized when it was too late to do anything about it, that you were wrong. And that you championed this evil, segregationist, divisionist approach to politics, to life, because this is bigger than politics. And this is the problem. The idea that Canada is broken is now becoming a political punching bag, but it's not, there's no platform that Pierre Polyev can put forward that's going to heal Canada. None whatsoever. Now, again, you could say theoretically that he could stop the damage, that he could stop making it worse. I certainly don't think Trudeau is going to heal Canada because he has a vested interest in it being broken. He is, it's working for him because the liberals, the people that vote for Justin Trudeau, their world is fine. They weren't the ones who were vaccine mandated out of their jobs. They weren't the ones who have been grappling with these very real struggles that are taking place. I mean, look at the discussion in Vancouver right now. Pierre Polyev uh, talks about Vancouver's uh, Lower East Side, and he talks about it as being hell on earth. And the media has a freak out about it. The mayor of Vancouver has a freak out about this because to them, everything is hunky dory. To them, it's a, well, yeah, we could always do a little bit better. It's like, it's like when you talk to Iran, Iran about its human rights abuse. It's like, well, yeah, we have, you know, we have some challenges we have to deal with, but who doesn't? Let he who's without sin cast the first stone. And it's this collective global gaslighting that is taking place and that is not helping anyone get better. 
So I'm going to say that there is a brokenness. I don't want to be the doomsayer here because I don't actually have the solution, but I'm telling you that you have to at least recognize the problem before you can diagnose it. You have to diagnose it before you can begin to find a solution for it. But certainly do not accept a politician looking at you, looking at your life or looking over you. They're looking past you. They're not even looking at you as an individual and, and saying, how dare you identify a problem? How dare you call out the fact that the world as it's structured right now, the country as it's structured right now, isn't working for you. We'll have more on this in the weeks ahead. I mean, the poll that came out was, I thought, a very tremendous one. 67% of Canadians, if you haven't seen this, 67% agree that Canada is broken. Now, just to put that in political terms, I, there has never been a government in this country, certainly not in the last century, that has had 67% of the vote. So to get 67% of people, more than two-thirds, to agree on something, to even get that many to agree that the sky is blue, I think would be a challenge. But 67% agree with Pierre Polyev's assertion, agree with my assertion, agree with the very real challenges that Canadians are putting forward that this country is broken. So Justin Trudeau is not only wrong, but he's not even fooling people. And I think that's an important message. And that's where a bit of hope may come through this and that people are not being duped into this. People are not letting themselves be gas lit. So we will revisit this, but I want to talk about some battlegrounds that oftentimes do not get nearly the attention they deserve. And that is the fights taking place in municipal politics. Now, in Ontario, we had a round of municipal elections just a few months ago. There were uh, some contentious school board battles as well. School board, another area where I think uh, more people, certainly those on the right, need to pay a bit more attention. But a new municipal watchdog has started to take aim at these big bloated uh, city council budgets. They are coming out guns blazing. Stella Ambler, the former conservative member of parliament, now the president of Municipal Watch, calling out municipal madness. Stella, always good to talk to you. Thanks for coming on today and congrats on the launch. Ability to talk about this, the opportunity, I'm, I'm kind of thrilled. Well, I'm glad you were, were very kind enough to invite me to speak at the Albany Club when my uh, book, The Freedom Convoy, came out. So happy to uh, return the favor at least a little bit here. Uh, you've done federal politics. I know you've uh, been involved at all levels. Why do you think municipal politics is where your efforts need to be focused now? Yeah, uh, actually, it, that it does kind of segue in, into that. Um, I have been involved mostly in my long political career at the provincial and federal levels and and you know just recently i realized that there's no opposition built into the municipal level so in in ottawa we have the house of commons and question period uh, and everyone knows who the opposition party is and and their job is to oppose the government and it's the same in uh, in the um, legislatures across canada there's it the opposition is built right into the city into, into the system and that actually provides uh, uh, automatically a level of oversight. And, and we don't have that uh, at the local level. And so I've, I've been finding that folks are just ordinary Canadians are very concerned about what's happening in their cities and towns, and they, they just don't know what to do about it. They, they, they need help. And so I thought, well, I'd like to help them speak out and call out examples of silliness and nonsense uh in in the municipalities i call it madness by the way you know i like the alliteration municipal madness so it works we'll get to some of the specific issues in a moment here uh certainly in an ontario context in most provinces bc is a bit of an outlier here there aren't political parties at the municipal level sometimes you see things that loosely resemble slates but oftentimes i think the real advantage of municipal politics is that you can have somewhat more independent minded people they aren't whipped I, but in your view is this a left-right issue uh absolutely not uh, of course I, I come at it personally as a small C conservative and there's nothing wrong as conservatives, as uh, people who want to see more transparency, uh, restraint, fiscal restraint. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, it's not, municipal politics is not generally partisan. There are no political parties involved other than, as you say, BC. But 
I find though that, so, so it's not partisan in nature, but it's more to, in my mind about common sense. Uh, you know, we really need to take a look at what folks are doing. Um, you, you talked about government. There's a, there's a whole debate in Canada now, is, is government broken, right? And so I thought about this municipally and I thought, well, I'm not, not sure if broken is the right word, but certainly there needs to be some perspective brought in. There are far too many municipalities who are overspending, overtaxing, overregulating, and just um, the, the kinds of policies and programs that they're putting into place are sometimes not even in their jurisdiction um, to have any say. And, and yet they waste resources uh, debating it, studying it. Uh, and you know, we've, I think we really, we need someone to call that out. And I wanna be the person to, to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I generally have a, a years-long crusade against bylaw enforcement, which I feel is probably a department that I would support abolishing wholesale. I, I won't get you to comment on that because I don't want you to be off the ground before you're uh, really off the ground with this. But the, the one thing I, I will point out is that there have been so many issues where someone is fined for something so ridiculous. A case in Oshawa recently where a group of volunteers were fined uh, because they wanted to distribute uh, food and necessities to the homeless and they didn't have a permit from the city to do it. I once had a ticket because I was legally parked in front of my own house, but the car was facing the wrong direction. And it was just for a very silly reason because I was rearranging oh, things yeah. in the driveway, but very yeah. stupid stuff like that that comes up. And, and every time I hear about these things, it's like, oh yeah, it's a $50 ticket. It's a $60 ticket, but it's part of a culture, I think, that is bigger than that in municipalities, which is this really incessant need to regulate these very very minute details about people's lives. I have a friend in London, uh, so you, you two could meet up for coffee and he could tell you about his his fight with the city over a particular tree on his property. <laughs> um, <laughs> I won't go into the details, but suffice to say he, he, he wrote many letters to the mayor, to his councillors, and I don't think he won in the end, but the uh, level of bureaucracy needed to deal with that uh, was he, it just it was over, it was startling to him. He could not believe what happened. But, you know, I, I think a lot of the issues too stem from uh, municipalities, municipal councillors wanting to uh, maybe even prove their worth, let's say, and and they they want to signal that they are on top of the issues of the day. So they declare climate emergencies, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and you know what? What good is that really going to do? Um, then it that trickles down a little further into, let's say, natural gas bans, which are all the rage now. Um, and um, you know there are places like Montreal where you can't have a wood burning fireplace anymore. Um, yeah, it's really uh, the, the issues are are not within their jurisdiction. They're wasting our tax dollars just by talking about them. And, and if they, if, if, e even if, even if the province, um, you know, Andrew, I saw a report by the uh, Ontario's independent electricity system operator that said that, yes, we could ban natural gas by, by the year 2050, and it would cost approximately $400 billion. So this is the sandbox that municipalities are playing in now, right? It's just, let's stick to service delivery. There's, there's enough of responsibility to go around and when your responsibilities are water water quality um, fire ambulance police roads transit uh, and parks and recreation the more and there's a there's a ton that that of uh, that they, that they of policies and programs that they already have have to do so and now they're getting into you know how people heat their homes and um and, and, you know, frankly, the people who are losing are the people who can afford it the least. Um, the people who can't yeah. afford to retrofit their home for $100,000 uh, to, to use uh, a heat pump instead of, um, instead of natural gas, for example. You anyway. mentioned London, a city yeah. I live in in Ontario. A friend of mine told me this story years ago that I, I've never actually shared on the show, and I, I should now. 
because he, he had a visitor that was coming in from out of town who was driving through London and they drove by this, you know, giant multi-million dollar water park the city built. They drove by these stupid metal trees that the city had built and spent money on. They drove by all of this stuff that the city had spent millions and millions on uh, to bring the city up to this global standard they had set. And the only thing the person noticed was that like the potholes were going to destroy his car's suspension. So it's like cities need yeah. to do the things that like do the bare minimum before they get to these really lofty aspirational right. things. But right now, like there's the big discussion going on of these so-called 15 minute cities and redesigning the entire urban planning to make everything mm -hmm. a, a 15 minute uh, jaunt from your house. And it's like, focus on the basics first. Like if you were able to do all these core things, well, I might have confidence that you could do the big stuff well, but cities aren't doing that by and large. Oh, the, the fifth, nothing scares me more than these 15 minute cities. Uh, the more I go down that rabbit hole and the more afraid I become that municipalities, more municipalities in Canada won't start looking into this. I think Edmonton, is it Edmonton? Or uh, and, and Newmarket has definitely talked about it. I, well. Edmonton has and, as well, I believe, yeah. Edmund, yeah, I, I wasn't sure. Um, I, I, uh, I've been reading a bit about Edmonton because they're proposing um, I think I believe it's a seven percent tax hike, property tax hike, that you know, over the next four years. So, you know, I mean, compounded. If you think about uh, what that adds up to, I, most people just can't afford this. In my my old stomping grounds of Mississauga, they just passed what the mayor called a no frills budget, uh, with a only three percent tax increase, which is twice. I know, right? A twice as big as last year's. Uh, last year's increase, and it includes so so no frills, which they consider to be um, um, very uh, uh, frugal, I guess. Um, and they're holding back. That still includes a two percent increase in salaries and compensation for all non-union employees, including the councillors and the mayor. And uh, and it includes twenty-two million dollars more for salaries and compensation. Plus, I hate to tell you. Some, I think it was 10 or 14 more bylaw, overnight bylaw officers. So if you park your car the wrong way again, there'll be someone in Mississauga who will give you a ticket for that. I appreciate the forewarning there, but uh, yeah, I learned my lesson uh, once on that right one. Direction. But. Let me ask you then, Stella, do you think the problem is that provinces are being too lenient with how they let municipalities run their affairs? Or, or do you think that the problem is actually at the municipal level and that we have to just change the culture there? I think in, certain, in some provinces, the, the, the provincial governments are not helping. Uh, but I think they're doing, to be honest with you, the municipalities are doing enough damage on their own. Um, I, there aren't too many... Um, um, I, I don't think you could blame the provincial government, for example, for an Ottawa LRT that doesn't run mm -hmm. when there's freezing rain. Um, that really, you know, you can't really blame the province for that. As we might try, but you know, we can't. We can't blame the we can't blame the BC government when Vancouver decides to buy electric fire trucks that pump 40% less water, um, uh, which you know becomes a public safety issue. I, I mean, frankly, in some cases, I wish, I, it, I wish the provinces would step in. Um, but you know, you, you know, I don't think we're. I won't hold my breath for that to happen. I, I know you've just launched a municipal watch uh, within the last couple of weeks here. But do you have a, a first big battle in mind? Do you have the Goliath you want to slay first? I'm working on so many things, but I, and every time I, I, I think, okay, I've found it, the one. I, I get an email from someone because because the response has been just incredible. Um, I I'm already over, overwhelmed with emails. I'm, I'm sure you can understand. People have so much to say and so much to talk about. So what, while I'm do I'm researching a big project um, uh, on on increase in number of full time employees. So so wait for it because because I'm going to I'm I'm looking into that. I've I've studied about. 20 cities so far, and it's already shocking, but I want to gather more data and, uh, and on the, the, the growth in cities, so population versus full-time. But then I'll get an, an email from someone like I did this morning in Calgary who asked me the question, um, why is it that 
a municipal councillor in the city of Calgary has three staff, three employees in his or her office, and MLAs only have one. Mm. Is the, so it's little thing, and I think, okay, well, that's not something I need to spend hours researching. But on the other hand, wait a minute, why are things like this happening? And, you know, again, does it pass that common sense sniff test? And does it, does it tell you, when you hear about things like this, does it tell you that the municipality, the city or town is actually looking out for people and uh, putting people first? Or are they, are they putting their own interests first? Or are they trying to somehow um, uh, just be politically correct or virtue signal on some particular issue? Uh, so this is, these are the kinds of things uh, that, so I start out on the lofty aspirational level and, and then, and then I stop and think, wait a minute, maybe I should do something about the fact that, that maybe I should call attention and shine a light on the fact that municipal councillors have our, our staff heavy. Anyway, so uh, and to be honest, it sounds like you need to run for Calgary city council. So you'll get three staffers to help you get through the <laughs> workload. Exactly. Exactly. I do have I do have some help, some volunteers and some interns and and that's going very well. Um, but in the well, my my hope is that that I can form with all of these people who are emailing from across the country, I can form a coalition of local watchdogs who will also help me. And uh, so far, that's going pretty well. Well, it's, a, it's an important battleground. And, you know, it's easy to take aim at the Canadian government. There's just one. It's easier to some extent to take aim at provincial governments. We've got 10 of them. When you get to municipalities, you're talking about hundreds of large and medium-sized ones, not to mention uh, thousands beyond that. Uh, so I think it very much needs some scrutiny here. I'm so glad you're doing it. People can learn more at municipalwatch.ca. President of Municipal Watch, former MP Stella Ambler. Always a pleasure, Stella. Thanks so much for coming on today. Thank you, Andrew. It was my pleasure. Hey, Take thank care. you. We'll definitely have you back on as you uh, get and start working through those battles there. And I have to pat myself on the back here, made it through my first pneumonia edition of the Andrew Lawton show. Everything's broken in country, including my lungs. So uh, thank you very much. We'll be back tomorrow with more of the program here. Uh, but if you want to support the work we're doing at True North, you can head on over to donate.tnc.news, donate.tnc.news. And I would also tell you that our friends at Second Street org have done a new documentary which i would very much encourage you to check out it's called defund putin and the question is really how can canada cut vladimir putin's military budget the documentary from secondstreet.org is available over at defundputin.ca and i believe we have the trailer for it that we can play for you right now oh we don't have the trailer But uh, this is the Andrew Lawton Show. We will be back in uh, just a couple of, uh, well, but not a couple of days. We'll be back in one day. Uh, that's all on uh, True North, the Andrew Lawton Show tomorrow. Thank you. God bless and good day to you all.